up guys we out here this is Maylee Tao your donut princess and we are here with Dorothy Wong today I'm super excited to have her on my podcast I feel that she and I are kind of on the same wavelength of what we want to achieve from holding our parents legacy telling their stories and reclaiming this power that we have of storytelling so I'm super excited to have you here today Dorothy Chow um tell me a little bit about what it was like for you growing up and what you're up to now. And then we'll dive into some amazing topics that I, I think would be great for today. Yeah. So um, thanks so much for the intro. My name is Dorothy Chow, as you mentioned. Um, I currently am the host of the Death in Cambodia Life in America podcast, which is what I do now. I'm also the, I guess you can say, COO of B&H Bakery Distributors up here in NorCal. Um, I grew up in NorCal. I'm based in the Bay Area, um, close to San Francisco, about 30 minutes east, and grew up in a community that was predominantly like white and Asian, but Asian, like more Chinese mm -hmm. people. And so I didn't grow up uh, with a big influencer community of Cambodians around me, which as I'm starting to learn is that there, you know, people in Long Beach, for example, get that like really strong Cambodian identity from like their upbringing because that's what they grew up in. Um, that's definitely not what I grew up in, but um, it's it's okay. So I uh, grew up and actually went to school, college at uh, UCSD, which is your alumni school as well. So, hey, yeah. try it. Yes. <laughs> what so year? Cool. Uh, 2015. Okay. So you're a little younger than me, but I was graduated yeah. 2012. So, okay. Uh, UCSD is a great, great school. Amazing campus. That must campus. mean that we, we probably really were on campus at the same time. Yes. Probably on <laughs> library walk or something together. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Um, but yeah, went to school, UC San Diego. I um, graduated, worked in marketing for a few years, and then moved back home to take over the business, which is basically what I'm doing now. <laughs> Amazing. Thank you for sharing all of that. I think when you were talking about growing up in like a not really Cambodian dense uh, neighborhood, I could definitely relate to that. I, mm -hmm. uh, our parents ended up settling ultimately in West LA and there were like no Asians in West LA. I was the only Asian girl like at my high school, like people had never really seen like any Asians at all. So um, yeah. I know what you mean where it's like, oh okay like you're you're Cambodian that people will be like where's Cambodia like nobody even like knew when we were like a young kid <laughs> um and it's super cool that you went to UCSD as well did you study communications I actually studied economics okay well still which, needed anyways <laughs> which is um a ton of math which I'm actually really not good at math and but I at that point I mean I was like three years in and I was like well just one more year to go so I guess I'm <laughs> through but um yeah no I definitely what's funny when you talk about like when you tell people that you're Cambodian when you're growing up like actually my mom told me from a very young age that if anybody asks me what I am I should mm -hmm. say that I'm Chinese okay so that's why actually I feel like this whole identity of calling myself Cambodian is actually very recent mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm. in the last couple of years, because when I was growing up, I really identified more so as Chinese. And like, when people ask me what I am, she would, she would be like, just tell them that you're Chinese, which mm -hmm. I mean, that is really just another topic on its own of like why she wanted me to say that. But um, yeah, it is, it is very interesting, you know, and, and even like now when you say that you're Cambodian, people are like, oh, what an exotic place you come from. <laughs> like, it's like, right. Like, you know, like it just sounds like very uncommon. So is, um, did your grandparents come from China? So I found out recently that it was my great grandparents that came from China. Okay. Um, and so my grandparents were actually still born in Cambodia and okay. so were my parents. So I'm actually a little bit farther removed from like the Chinese heritage than I thought right, I was, right? Uh, which is uh, still really crazy when I learn stuff like that. It really like messes with my identity sometimes. It's just like, yeah, I, yeah. I feel you on that one because like 
yeah, growing up. So for, for my, my, my family, um, mm-hmm. my grandparents immigrated from, from China and both my parents were born in Cambodia. So if you really look at like from a blood perspective, right, our blood yeah. is Chinese, but, you know, considering all the things that happened in Cambodia, considering like, I guess, reputation stuff, uh, our parents have a weird way of also teaching us identity. And so I could see how you would be confused because I was just as confused. I remember one day, like I was sitting at the dinner table with my dad and he was like, so if somebody asks you, you know, what nationality are you, what do you say? And I'm like, uh, I'm Chinese. He's like, no, 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 you're Chinese, Cambodian and Thai and you're American. And like, I think that was such an eye-opening thing for me because I was like, how am I all of those things? He's like, you, you, we have so much family in Thailand. We have, you know, your, your grandpa's part Thai, you know, your, even though your grandparents were born in China, well, we were born in Cambodia. That makes you Cambodian too. And I was like, really? Okay. And when, when you explain it to people, they don't really get it. But when you do meet other Cambodians who are mixed with Chinese, like I totally get it. Like I, yeah, I 100% understand. Um, does your family still speak Chinese? Like, do they speak Chichao? No, they speak Guangzhou. So okay. I, grew up, I grew up, uh, learning Cantonese. I actually okay. went to Cantonese school. I never learned Cambodian because my parents never taught me. Same. And- you don't know either? No, I was trying to Oh my to god, learn. I feel so good now. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no, they didn't want to teach us. They didn't yeah. want to teach. I I was, I get so mad at my parents sometimes. I'm like, why didn't you teach me? I could totally use it now. But yeah. so my parents what they said was they said, "Hey, we were we we came to America. We thought we weren't going to go back to Cambodia. We thought we were done with that place considering all the atrocities that happened there. So that's why we didn't want to give you that Cambodian accent. We wanted you to like go full throttle with English and like obviously I still I still speak Chichao and other languages, but um but yeah, like yeah it's frustrating right like you're just like so when they like people start talking Cambodian to you, you're like uh like you can get by with a few words right <laughs> yeah I mean I think if I've actually gotten better now because now that I've been working at B&H um all of my clients are technically donut shop owners who you know are refugees mm-hmm. and speak Cambodian so I hear it every day now whereas before before working at B&H and you know, doing this whole thing, I I didn't. So the past couple of years, I've actually been soaking it up a lot more. Nice. Um, but it's I still cannot really speak, and it's it's interesting to think that like your parents said the same thing, like they didn't want to teach you Cambodian. I think it was the same for my parents. Like, there's a kind of shame that is associated with what they had survived through, and I think the yeah. I, I it's shame or it's like embarrassment from Mm -hmm. the Khmer Rouge when they came here they're like I don't want I don't want you to learn anything from it I don't want you to tell people that you're Cambodian that you speak Cambodian like none of that stuff um it is it's interesting too like I'm 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 learning more and I'm being more comfortable now with like claiming that identity um yeah I'm glad and like more power to you. I I think I am also going through a similar journey too, because like, if I really think about it, I'm not like blood Cambodian, but like the way that I was brought up was very Cambodian. Like the the types Mm -hmm. of dishes at the dinner table are very much mixed in with, with the, both the Chinese, the Cambodian kind of stuff. So I mean, I, I, I definitely know what you mean of like, basically trying to like, reclaim that and being like saying it powerfully like yeah I am part Cambodian part Chinese whatever it may be I think it's oftentimes just labels and again like we kind of have to like unpack like what our parents think our identity should be and claim what our own identity should be yeah um you mentioned that you are working at B&H and it's so funny because my uncle started B&H like many many years ago Is is your okay so um I'm learning all the history now um, as we do the podcast. In season two, we yeah. flesh out like everything that my dad from the beginning to the end. And so is your uncle the one that's, uh, is is what's what's your uncle's name? So his last name is Tao and his Bun first Tao. name is Bun Tao. Yeah, Bun that's, Tao. That's okay, my, okay. That's, that is my dad's brother. And oh, I, wow. And I literally had to learn all of this actually through when they when the documentary came out yeah like the pieces were put together and I was like oh yeah B&H but it's so cool to see that it's still in operation now 
It is. Um, I think what from what my dad recalls from the podcast and what I've learned from him anyway, is that uh, your he took it over from your uncle um, and uh, he brought it up to NorCal while okay. your uncle ran the SoCal. Mm-hmm. I, I, I'm not, you have to listen to the podcast and kind of draw the lines, but um, it is cool because, you know, at one point we were also known as Golden Bake. Yes. Remember yes. that. And I okay. had uh, aunties and uncles who worked for Golden Bake as well. Yeah. Which is crazy. Crazy. So, but it, but now thinking back, I'm like, that was a really smart move to, you know, I think that running donut shops, obviously I've run one and I don't know if you've run one, but you work with donut shop owners and it's definitely a struggle. And to see them kind of think, oh, well, there's a distrib- distribution need. Like, let me, let me see what that looks like and explore that business. Like, I think that like our families are all just hustlers just trying to figure it out. And so that's so cool that your, your dad might know my uncle, like they might just work together. And yeah, no, I I'm sure that this, there's so much overlap. I am sure that there's many people we're probably related like in some way, like honestly, like we're just, it's it's somewhere like it's very, very close, but um, yeah, it, it's, it's it's been pretty wild I felt like uh you know I remember Golden Bake as well like growing up as a kid I uh I remember um the big grand opening that we used to have and and the the whole community kind of coming together with it Mm -hmm. um donut shops I I grew up in a donut shop I didn't actually run one before but Mm I managed one for my mom and parents enough to where I feel like I know. Oh, oh yeah. Really Definitely like. folded some pink boxes in your day, right? Yeah. 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 From the very <laughs> early years, but um, it is tough. It is a tough industry to be in. And there's really not a whole lot of suppliers out there, to be honest. I mean, right. I can probably, you probably really know who they are, but you know, there's yeah. really only Bake Mark and Dawn. Yeah. And um, I don't know if Rob Ross goes down to LA, but um I haven't heard that one but yeah the the big wins are those two and uh over the years like smaller ones will pop up and they'll just kind of get acquired by like the bigger ones but you know exactly exactly so so how is B&H doing up there is it like thriving with everything happening there's a rise in supplies as a as the pandemic has uh occurred right tell us a little Um, bit about the distribution industry yeah so it's it, it's it's been crazy the past two years actually the supply chain has been an absolute mess yeah um, clearly I mean obviously when it when you see it in the grocery stores that's when you know that like shit's really hit the fan like it's right. been accumulating for like six to eight months it's just insane um but uh thankfully the donut shops did pretty well throughout the pandemic because yes. at the end of the day they are still naturally takeout and they're still you're still able, they're not sit down. So you can, mm-hmm. you can still go in, get your stuff and go out. And, yes. um, you know, donut shops were able to kind of fit the exact requirements that you needed to just kind of slide by <laughs> through the pandemic, which, um, which is awesome, I think. Um, and I've been doing it for about five, six years now. I've okay. been up here. Um, at this point, I would say that I, I basically run it, uh, you know, I'm do all the operations. I mean, my dad, my dad's just kind of there as an advisory role, but he's not really around. He doesn't have to be. Yeah. Um, so it's, it's crazy, but it's, it's also really, really rewarding because, mm-hmm. you know, as I said, my clients and my customers really are the donut shop people and the mm-hmm. refugees and the Cambodians. And um, we're kind of the last ones serving our own people. I mean, other than yeah. that, big giant companies are like, billion trillion dollar conglomerates and yeah. um and we're still going strong I think we've been growing in sales ever since I kind of stepped in and like tried to pull this company to the 21st century which has been uh it's <laughs> challenging been that's so yeah. funny that you you said that exact line because that's what I said I used to tell people about what I did with my, my family's donor shop I'm like I have yeah. I had to revamp it so it could make it into the 21st century because yeah. you have to adapt you know and like yeah. unfortunately a lot of Cambodians are very very traditional very stubborn very stuck in their ways but you know it's 
it's our generation that has to show them, hey, there's a new way to do this. There's a way easier way to do this. Like let's let's get some systems in place, you know, let's let's get us up on the digital age. So I'm so happy that BH is still running. When I see my uncle next, I'll definitely tell him that I talked to you and, and <laughs> see if he remembers his old business partner. Still alive. It's still alive. <laughs> yes. Still breathing. <laughs> well, let's get really into, you know, Death in Cambodia podcast. Uh, when I first stumbled upon the podcast, I was blown away. I was just really like excited to hear another perspective of another survivor of the Khmer Rouge. My parents were both survivors as well. And seeing somebody else document it in a really new way, I got super excited. So I've been listening to it. And it's so funny because I feel like I'm listening to like my mom telling stories because, you know, young, older people like with the, with their English capacity, they, they tell it in a way that it's not super flowery, but it's like straight to the point with a little bit of like their mannerisms, which I really love that banter between you two. Oh, what, you. what has been, you know, your favorite story that your father's told you that you've been able to share on the podcast? And how do you feel like your father has felt after sharing all those stories on the podcast so far? Um, that's really, really hard. Uh, <laughs> it's a really hard question to answer because I feel like there's two parts of it, right? There's like yeah. the season one, that's like the deep, dark details of the Khmer Rouge and exactly what happened. Um, which, yeah, I think is very unique because there's just not this kind of content out there. Mm -hmm. Um, and then there's season two, that's like, how did he get here in America? And then like, basically, you know, thrive in America with this empire that he's created so um I mean my favorite there's probably like the deepest and then my favorite but give my, me both my favorite give me both okay so, I mean I'm gonna say both okay because it's just, they're just two different things but the the deepest one that he shared with me was when he you know, when during Khmer Rouge, you didn't have, um, you didn't get food. You only got like food, right. like two or three spoons of rice a day. Yeah. And when he was getting his food portion, one of the days, he had noticed that basically the guy behind him who was working in his little kind of a group with him mm -hmm. had, was really, really sick, had malaria yeah. or what he so believed. He was pale. He passed out from working. And that day, you only get two scoops of rice, but that day my dad ended up giving his food portion to that guy because it just, even though he was himself was starving, that guy looked like he needed it more. Yeah. And um, my dad broke down saying that, like he actually cries. And in this podcast, we get real raw. I mean, yeah. probably the, the, you know, I tell people that I've only seen my dad cry maybe like three or four times in my entire life. And like the three, two or three times were like in this exact podcast setting mm -hmm. room. So he really was scraping just the memories that he had buried in the back of his head. And um, that guy actually ended up dying the next day and he ended up having to bury him. And it's just crazy, mm. crazy stories like that, which, yeah. um, which we got into my favorite story that I think is more on the funny end um, going into season two would be when he was starting donut shops and he was building like the donut shops in NorCal. So I think mm -hmm. your uh, uncle Ted was the one that, you know, really definitely just blew up the donut industry for everybody and then yes. the refugees. But um, my dad did kind of the same thing, but mm -hmm. he went north. Yes. Um, and one of the, when he was, I asked my dad, cause he was living in the back of a donut shop of one of the donut shops that he was running. And I was asking, I was like, wait, like physically lived? Like, how did you shower exactly? Like logistically, there's no shower in the back of a donut shop. Like, how did you, he was like, well, you know, you just stand outside and take the hose and you just kind of like spray yourself in the back and I was like oh my god like these our parents have a different level of grit that we just will never be able to even achieve or compare ourselves to <laughs> like I was like like you just spraying yourself and showering in the back of a shop so I don't know I thought that was really really funny um 
probably one of my favorite moments. <laughs> Sounds like something yeah. that I, I feel what you know what stories like that really like have the impact on me is is like you know when I hear those those two experiences from your dad I think about my mom <clears throat> and yeah there are really really sad crazy atrocious things that we only hear them talk about but they've seen it they've lived through it like my mom saw my mom like witnessed like families being buried alive and like people being burned to death like right before yeah. eyes at such a young age so <clears throat> it's really awesome that you gave him that platform that space to finally talk about it I think because of Khmer Rouge and how they would brainwash a lot of the kids is they sh they will never be able to talk about it and if they do someone will find them and that fear I still feel like impacts a lot of the general public today where they are scared to talk about it they they legit think that somebody's still going to come for them and they never really had that space to talk about it so when you talk about your your dad like actually like expressing emotion and crying like you know our parents are some of the strongest people and they like just they just don't cry they just like hold it in and they're just like really like resilient and they just like go through it and like I mean your dad's showering in the back with a hose like they'll do anything to make sure like you know they are operating the business here in America and surviving and I am just so impressed with any survivor stories um, because it's pretty remarkable that number one they survived number two they can tell the story today and there is just so much more power when when they when you hear it from them you know when you hear it from them and you save that uh yeah. who do you yeah. who with the with the podcast like who have you been able to impact like share some stories with me about people who have listened to your podcast and come back to you yeah it's it's pretty wild um you know, I, I get all sorts of people. I mean, currently it is, we have international listeners. It's crazy uh, from, I'll actually have a big base in Cambodia, like Cambodian listeners as well. Um, funny enough, like all the countries that really started listening to it first were the ones that would have like, who took on Cambodian refugees. So mm -hmm. like Australia, um, France, um, the U S obviously, mm -hmm. like there were definitely like bubbles of that, that first, when they caught on real fast to the podcast, which makes sense, right? Because the, the refugees and kind of the diasporas went that direction. Yeah. Um, but I get a lot of DMS, um, about people just saying, oh my gosh, you know, anything from like, I never knew about the Khmer Rouge. This is so cool. Like mm -hmm. I'm educating people to major, you know, second generation, Cambodian Americans like you and I who have parents who never talked about it ever and for the first time are listening to the podcast and are actually realizing like whoa my parents really went through so much like so much that I could never even comprehend like I had ab they had absolutely no idea and those people are my favorite people to impact because mm -hmm. I've had some messages for people. The, the most powerful DM that I've gotten was like, wow, I never knew what my parents had gone through. And listening to your podcast has given me so much more empathy for my parents yes. and has given me so much more understanding um, for the fact that maybe my childhood was not the way it was because maybe my parents were, my parents were dealing with trauma yeah. and you know, at the time, like as a kid, you don't really process that. And then you can grow up. If you know, don't actually address it, you can grow up kind of resenting your parents. I feel like, you know, if it's never really addressed. Um, and so, or it's never really, there's never that communication or understanding. Mm -hmm. Um, and so those are the favorite, the, the most, I mean, those, those, those are the ones that really impact me that I get DMS like that. I'm like, oh my gosh, it doesn't matter how many accolades this thing gets. Like it's these DMS that I'm getting from people like individual people who are being impacted by this, who are, um, or, you know, like are healing, essentially healing themselves, uh, you know, learning more about their identity, healing their relationships with their families, eat kind of indirectly, mm -hmm. you know, in a sense. So, um, I'm really, really passionate about that. I'm passionate about 
about this whole healing aspect, healing the refugees, healing the second generation, because, you know, I feel like if we just keep kind of tiptoeing around the topic, when we're, you know, this, this whole opportunity to learn from them is just going to pass us by because they're all different. Right. And um, there's only so many refugees left, really. Mm -hmm. I mean, it, you know, and, and a lot of them already are starting to kind of lose their memory, starting kind of like, you know, not quite remember. So it's, um, I'm, I'm just, I'm just, I just hope that I can capture what we have left. Yeah. I've, I'm like on this, I'm totally on board with you with the whole healing thing. And I just feel like, you know, maybe that's one of our duties as their kids is like to pull them out of that and to get them out of there. Uh, you know, I think uh, one, you know, I wrote a book earlier this year about my mom's experience. I also launched it on audio audible this week. So hey, I'm hoping congrats more, on that. I saw that. Thank you. So I'm <laughs> hoping more people will get to, you know, understand her specific perspective. But when you talk about healing, I just, I think, you know, what you are saying about also resentment when you're like a young kid, your, your parents don't have that explanation to you they 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 automatically assume you won't understand you're not interested uh you know like any of those things so of course resentment starts to build you you your parents like they're not even sure how to communicate that to you are there even like the words in Chinese or Cambodian to communicate that to you I mean they just learned English like like I don't think that they can really dive in but you know, by, by really encouraging our families to, you know, document these stories, whether that's in a book or a podcast or whatever it may be, it just creates this like secret, like little network of people where like people really appreciate that he is so vulnerable enough to speak out and, and tell his story. My question to you, it's like a side question. It's like, did you ever wonder what it would be like if you were a refugee of a different international country, like if you were like, if you ended up in France or if you ended up in Australia instead of America, like, do you ever think about that? Because I do. (laughs) You know what? I actually had met some, um, this uh, Cambodian French second generation girl who currently is in college, um, who was an orphan and got mm-hmm. adopted by a French family. So now she currently is in France, but she's French Cambodian. Okay. Um, and it it the first time that I met her through Zoom, because I was helping her out, she's in a master's program. She wanted to interview for me for, for a project. And mm-hmm. first time I met her, I I just immediately she was like, Yeah, I'm an orphan living in France. And I and you know, and I I just hit me. I was like, oh my gosh, like there's so many ways that this really could have gone. Yes. Like I could have been an orphan too. Like I I could, it's a high percentage of like, of of that I could have completely lost my entire family. I mean, and lucky enough, like you and I, our entire families were able to come here. But I mean, there's other, there are a bunch of other countries and this could have really gone a bunch of ways. Um, I could have been alone, you know, I could have, I could have not been adopted and still have been in Cambodia, you know, yeah. so there's just, it's, it's crazy. I mean, the diaspora is like, I am only one story out of so many. Yeah. I think about too, if like, we never like left Cambodia, like what would yeah. that look like? And, you know, I've gone back quite a few times and, you know, when I'm with my mom, it's like, it's like very like, like surface level Cambodia stuff it's like we'll go to the temple we'll eat good food we'll go see a waterfall like you know all that stuff but like I went out with my cousin one time and he took me to a KTV and he was like he he, I like we we weren't there to like really drink like it was really late and he just like I want to show you this KTV and I was like okay and it's karaoke bar but what people don't know in Cambodia is that there are underage women prostitutes that are literally within the ages of like 10 to 16. So the first time I had seen with my own eyes and been in a KTV <clears throat> and seen the the girls who were so young, like, honestly, it broke my heart. And I like, you know, it gave me like a new flame. Like my, I like went home crying. I was like, how, how can they like, how, like, 
I think what it's it's such it's so outrageous because I feel that because of the lack of a really solid education for a lot of the village like the the younger poor village kids is that number one the access to education it's like you know like your like your dad like an hour two hours away by walking or biking uh the quality of education is not there and this little girl has to decide do I want to hustle and and partake in this or do I go to school and try to figure it out like but it's harder you know and I feel like these are just these are just things that we don't have to deal with like we were born in a completely new country with new freedoms new new cultural aspects and I'm just so like still very outraged by that and wish that I could go in and like somehow change the system somehow but also like just feeling really grateful that we had this opportunity here um I don't know about yeah. you but with your with your when you graduated from UCSD like was were your parents just so happy like that was like the creme of the creme like they were just super happy for you yeah I mean my dad I I grew up my dad was really strict with me growing up and yeah there was absolutely no way I would have not graduated from UC <laughs> like there was no way that was not going to happen yeah um I don't know if that was the same for you but yeah <laughs> it was not like you had a choice but I think when I did graduate, he was very, very happy. I think he has a lot of pride. I mean, I'm yeah. one out of four. I'm one out of four. I'm the youngest. And so um, all of us graduated with with great degrees. And I think, yeah. you know, and, and our parents should be proud. I mean, yes. they really came here with absolutely nothing and and put their kids through a, you know, a, a American university, which is not cheap. And, mm -mm. um, and it's a lot of hard work. So it's, it's, uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's crazy. I, I, I think a lot of the second generation, I, I can't speak for everybody, but I think a lot of us deal with, um, a lot of guilt with, oh, yeah. with understanding that we are so lucky. Like it's so, um, I actually brought on one of my guests that's going to be, uh, coming onto the podcast is a licensed therapist. Mm -hmm. Um, and, tr and she's very trauma informed on, um, Asian American people. That's like her clientele. And I asked her like the different aspects of what it feels like to be an immigrant, especially in America. And she definitely talks about that as like guilt being one of the things like guilt of, um, guilt of not impressing our, our family, guilt of the fact that you were even brought here to this amazing place. And, it, and it's even harsher. It's even, it's three times harsher when you're like a child of a refugee. Like that's even, that guilt is even further on, you know I mean? And it's, it's crazy. Like something that I feel like we all deal with as second generation Cambodian Americans is like, uh, even though we talked about identity, like we talked about a modge podge of like being Chinese, Cambodian, Thai, whatever. If your parents survived the Khmer Rouge that and are refugees, that alone brings all of us together. That mm -hmm. alone makes you Cambodian more so than anything else. Like yeah. I've started to really learn that that no matter what kind of like DNA you have, there is a different kind of experience being a child of a refugee. Yeah. Um, that I feel like that brings the entire community together. Yeah, no, thank you for sharing that. And I think you're right. Like when we just kind of separate this, like getting it right, it's just that it, you don't have to get it right. Like we just are, like we are these children yeah. of refugees. And the, when you talked about guilt, I feel like guilt is just, has surrounded so many parts of my life, um, but mm -hmm. never, never really considering that our parents feel that same type of guilt as well and passing it through generational trauma which we'll get into in a little bit yeah. um and just like trying to navigate through all that can be so confusing and I'm just like really glad that you started this podcast so people can find a little bit of clarity what yeah. do you think is the most challenging part of telling our own history and uh I just want to tell you I love the little like inserts of like 
you know, your dad will be like, it was 1978. You're like, actually it was 1975 (laughs) (laughs) because also at that time you have to know there were no iPhones. There were no Apple watches. They didn't know what year it was and their, their minds might be a little bit fuzzy. So I really appreciate the little like historical things, but what do you feel like is the most challenging part about that, about your podcast? Um, well, I, I definitely was very aware that in season one, I could, I could be potentially the first person to educate some people who had never heard about the coverage yes. ever. Yeah. And so I was very aware of that. And I wanted to make sure that I was like saying things, right. Yeah. Like <laughs> explaining things correctly, talking about the right years, because this is like also an educational thing for some people. So right. Um, I did a lot of research uh, in season one, for sure, to make sure that that was all correct. Um, the most, you're saying the most difficult thing in, in creating the podcast or like what, what aspect? In what I think aspect? The, the most challenging part about telling our own history mm-hmm. is like, I think for me, <clears throat> it's similar to making sure I'm telling all sides of the story, like more of like, okay, Lonel came and did this. And then like King Sihanouk did this because I feel like it was so, so chaotic at that point. I feel like that's something I feel like I find very challenging. Like what is something that you feel like is challenging about really like telling our history in in the right way? Yeah. Yeah. Um, I can allude to that, but all, but in season two, like making Mm -hmm. sure that I capture the second generation aspects in the right way like season one the most difficult part was like doing the history right Mm -hmm. and you're like history sometimes can also be debated so it was really hard for me to like I had to really kind of do a lot of research and make sure I was saying the right thing in the right way um, because people can, especially on social media, can like really get on you. For oh, like, yeah. yeah. Actually, that's not correct. Yeah. And who did that happen because of this, not that. And, you know, that's season one. In season two, the most difficult part of telling our story would be um, would be the fact that I understand that I am only one perspective. Yeah. Not everybody has has a parent who got into the donut industry mm-hmm. so didn't not everybody um not everybody had had a parent who had become so like successful as my dad did you know and like yeah. had had so much luck in that way and I really wanted to make sure that I reflected other sides that I never experienced um so one of my guests that I had on was this photographer named Stuart is set and he is based in Seattle Mm -hmm. and uh, I shared some of his photography on my social media but he took a bunch of photography of like um, in this book called the corners of Argyle of a bunch of Cambodian refugees second generation in this building and just kind of like them living their lives and it shows another kind of grittier side of what the 90s looked like Mm -hmm. um, that I wouldn't have been able to allude to and talk about myself because I didn't live through that. Yeah. So in the second generation, I wanted to make sure that I showed that like, not everybody, you know, has like a grew up in a donut shop and was a donut kid and all that. Like there was other, there were other people around the U S that like, you know, didn't have such a, you know, such an experience. Yeah. Thank you for sharing that. Generational trauma, something that I talk about a lot and something that I learned, I think in my late twenties, early thirties of what it is and how it exists. And for me, there was, it was just pretty much like my upbringing, like where I started to really unpack how my mom raised me and the mannerisms that she had having gone through the genocide And it's also just something that we can't see. It's just trauma that's passed through body to body from different generations. So what's your experience of generational trauma? Mm, Great question. Um, I discovered generational trauma and how it exists in me uh, in the beginning of recording this podcast. So when I... I mean, I I always knew I had this kind of workaholic run, run, go kind of Mm -hmm. like mentality that I always felt like I had ever since I was young. Yeah. 
And it only got worse as I got older. And it got really, really bad when I took over BNH. I think okay. the very, very first year of BNH was probably the hardest emotional year yeah. I've ever experienced so far. I was so, you know, for the first time, especially as an entrepreneur, like, and then running a business, as I'm sure you know, you know, you don't have set lines. Like in college, you know exactly what you're supposed to do and the line, the way you're supposed to go. But when you are running a business on your own, it's just all you. And if you don't stop yourself, if you don't physically like stop yourself, you will just spiral down into the, like this deep, dark hole. Yes. And I did that. And I was so negative. My negative talk was so loud. It's gotten louder and louder and louder every year. Mm -hmm. When I started the podcast and launched it in 2021, I also started therapy. <laughs> Amazing. So, Therapy yeah, is um, good, guys. Don't don't go off of this old school <laughs> thinking that therapy is any which way. Therapy is great and everybody should definitely look into it, but continue. Yeah, yeah. No, therapy really, really opened my eyes for the first time to like what was happening physically in my body. Like um, it was really healing for me to like record my dad's story on Sundays, which is what I did. And then Monday, every Monday I would have therapy. It was like <laughs> Sunday. There was like Sunday, Monday, Sunday, Monday. Like, okay, well, we'll, we'll flush it out. I'll hear about my dad's past. I'll heal from that. Then I'll regurgitate it in therapy. Yeah. And um, it was a cycle. I did that for like 10 months. Um, I had learned that again, similar to you, the way that I was raised was was very much like work is number one yeah put above literally everything 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 <laughs> everything everything everybody listen again everything <laughs> everything <laughs> <laughs> I mean you could you could skip dinner with family you could do anything can be above be put above work and I felt like the way that I was raised is like the only way that I can be seen in this family is if I was the hardest worker in the room. And yeah. I always felt like watching my parents who were both just like, again, survivors from the Khmer Rouge. Um, I, I thought that the way that they worked was the way that I had to work. Mm -hmm. um, I had to learn over time that like, they're working like that because they are in survival mode yeah and I don't have to copy them because I am not in survival mode yeah and that was something that I really really had to like digest and I'm still working through like I'm mm -hmm. still not perfect at but um it's like this feeling of just like if I don't work I will fail if mm -hmm. I stop working, if I stop running, everything will fall apart. And um, I had to learn. I, I learned that, that that feeling that I had been dealing with for like 10 years, ever since I was like nine or 10 years old, that was that. That was yeah. generational trauma. Yeah. And it's such like a young age too, but you like didn't know, you couldn't identify it. Like they don't teach you generational trauma at school and they go, oh, if you feel this way, then that's that. Like, I think it really does take for first, second generation, uh, you know, Chinese Cambodians, daughters, sons of refugees is like just learning that there are certain things that have, that we have been raised in a certain way. Like we were, we, I, I tell people that my mom, like, she wanted us to be like warriors. She wanted us to like be the smartest. She wanted us to be the most efficient. She wanted us to be super, you know, she's super business minded. And like, I mean, I, I don't blame my parents at all for, for bringing me up in that way. I mean, there are certain things where like, I definitely like, you know, 
adapted some of those traits like my mom she's she's kind of a hoarder in a, in a way where like she'll if I say like I like this one noodle brand like she'll buy like 20 of them and like you know I'm, I don't know if you have similar experiences too but like there's love. there's that's a love language <laughs> yeah yeah that's a love language but what's really really cool is like now that I'm in my 30s I feel that I've created a new relationship with my mom and my parents where I could like show them like there's a minimalist lifestyle. Like we don't have to buy 20 of those noodles. Like we can just buy enough for one and like just educating them too on like, you know, healthier things that, you know, it can exist in our diets and like, like talking about what happened in their past too. Again, like, I feel like we play a really big part in their healing, uh, even though sometimes we don't give ourselves enough credit for it. <clears throat> but I definitely think that, you know, like, like, like for you, when you were going through your like Sunday, Monday routines of like recording and then going to therapy, like, I'm sure the, after you finish your recording on Sunday, like the, the, the feeling of is like, oh my God, like, because you're hearing details and things that you've never known before, never been like as curious about. And the fact that you ha hold the power to, you know, share that with the world is so incredible. I was wondering if you could share with my listeners some golden nuggets. So I call them golden nuggets because they're just like five quick little things they can take from the podcast of like how they can explore healing generational trauma in their own lives. My answer again is, is therapy. <laughs> yes. Therapy. What? <laughs> uh, therapy. Um, it's you know, this, this whole healing aspect is something that I, I'm still learning about, like exactly how do we go about this? And I've taken away again, a lot from this interview that I had with, um, licensed therapist that the episode's launching in a few weeks, but, and, and, and we basically talk about like healing, how do we start to heal ourselves? Um, from what the therapist told me, her mm -hmm. answer was to start by giving yourself grace that you deserve um healing starts from within from mm -hmm. from our conversation and it's it's it doesn't do you any good to sit here and think that you know like like just to spiral down and and into the this negative thinking of like guilt and that you and imposter syndrome and all these, these things like um it's coming from somewhere like give yourself grace. Um, and if you want to talk about it and really explore it, like therapy seems to be like one way to do it. Um, healing of our parents is, is also something I asked her this exact same question. I was like, mm -hmm. how can we as children, as second generation heal our parents? Like, what can we do to start that? And her answer was, it, really depends on the relationship that you have with your parents mm -hmm. um, healing for them is all about creating a safe space for your parents mm -hmm. what does that mean when you say safe space that means non-judgmental um open um you know fluid conversation that some people some parent child relationships just don't have that kind of connection yeah and um she she it's so and she was also kind of talking about how like there's this there's this like hierarchy between children and parents yes it's hard for you to be like hey mom dad just tell us everything you know so there's step one step two step three to heal and we're all going to be healed like yeah apparently it doesn't work that way I was hoping <laughs> that it did but it me doesn't. too yeah, me too. Me I was too. like, shoot, oh, dang. Dang, it. <laughs> dang it. And, um, she was like, she was like, yeah, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's a lot more nuanced than, than we all think. So anyway, yeah. going back to your original question, I mean, healing for yourself, go to therapy, healing for your parents, start by simply trying to, to have a better relationship with them. And, mm -hmm creating a, a, a safe space for them to feel like they can talk. Those are great suggestions. And I'm going to have a bonus golden nugget section that I feel like you and I can both tackle together. Um, I get a lot of questions of, hey, how did you get your parents to open up to you about what happened? Um, I get that question very, very often. Um, and, you know, I think 
for me, my, the first time my mom t- told me about the Khmer Rouge and what she went through, I was eight years old. And that's when I, I think that at that point I had experienced a little bit of generational trauma because I felt so many things that I didn't know how to like talk about or like didn't know who to talk to about until like I get older and I'm like, oh yeah, like you were just, you, you were a little girl and your mom told you all these crazy things that happened to her and you didn't know what to do with that information. Like, what do you do with it? Yeah. Yeah. Um, but when it came down to like writing the book for her and like recording her and like really like getting all the facts down, I think one thing that I can suggest for people is to really stay persistent and curious and really just tell them again, like show them the importance of why they have to tell their story and why it's so powerful. I think that <clears throat> the way that I explained it to my mom was like, don't you want like my kids to know what you went through? Like, I'm not going to remember every single detail. I need you to tell it so that they can understand and they can know it. And this is now our like family artifact. Like we get to like, I get to hold this and be like, this is what happened to our family. Like read it when you're ready. Like, you know, Um, but how about you? Like, are there any things that you can see from you interviewing your dad on the podcast and like, like that you can share with a, a lot of first, second generations who want to, their parents to open up, but are having a little bit of trouble? Yeah, I always, I get this question a lot too um, in my DMs. And I always find it like really, really hard to answer, to be honest with you, because mm. again, I think it depends on your relationship with your parent. Yeah. Like if you're not that close to your dad or you're not that close to your mom um, or there's a language barrier, yeah, you know, or, you know, there's, there's something that kind of, um, you know, that kind of stops them from, from sharing that. But I think you're right with the suggestions that you have in terms of like telling them the importance of it. Um, you know, for me, it was lucky because my dad already kind of wanted to say, to tell it, he just yeah. didn't have a platform. Nice. Um it wasn't, you know, he, he just didn't, I just didn't know all this stuff until I like shoved a mic in front of him. And he actually started telling details. I was like, Oh shoot, you really do know a lot. Like, like that. I don't know. And, and, but um, yeah, I mean, telling them that this is, this stuff really, really is important and you want to know. I mean, I think half the time the parents don't talk about it because one, they don't want to like re-traumatize their kids. Yeah. And then two is that half of the time they don't believe that, that the people they're telling would believe them. Yeah. I, I read this through, um, there's this author, a uh, UC Berkeley professor, her name's Katharia Um. Mm-hmm. And she wrote this book called, um, in, I think it's called uh, Something Something Utopia. Uh, I tried to get her as a guest on my podcast. That's how I know this. Um, and I read the book and she does have this chapter about the, uh, about silence from the okay. refugees and why they are, why they are silent. Mm-hmm. Um, it's this kind of like embarrassment slash shame slash, slash they're kind of in their own little world thinking mm-hmm. that nobody would believe them. So yeah, yeah encouraging them, um, building your relationship with them in general. Yeah. Um, and then, um, understanding that also too, you just can't force them if they don't want to. Right. Unfortunately, uh, again, there's no one, there's no step one, two or three. It's just kind of like, um, healing the parts that you can and and letting them know that like, you want to know, like, it's okay. It's okay. Like, this is a safe space. I think another cool thing that I just thought of is like, showing them that there are other people who have told their stories. One of the biggest rebuttals that my mom has told me when I was trying to like document her story is she's like, oh, there's like so many other like stories out there, all these other books and other people have done it already. I'm like, but nobody knows your specific story. Like you have seen so many things that, yeah, that person might've also seen those things too, but in a different way and a different way place like maybe they didn't escape to Thailand maybe they did something else like I feel like they're during that time like you could be in so many different places at the wrong time (laughs) and you know I'm so happy that our parents survived you know that we're here yeah and that we we totally get to have this power and tell their stories um what is up next for the podcast and 
like if there's like one thing that like you could walk away with knowing that your podcast did like share that with us um starting the conversation of healing with uh second generation um with themselves Mm -hmm. and also encouraging second generation to be curious about their parents and then to tangent off of that healing for the parents as well um Mm -hmm. One of the proudest things that I've ever done as part of this podcast, I I launched this YouTube video called Dear Fellow Survivors. Mm -hmm. And it is a speech of my father, my father saying this speech in Khmer Mm -hmm. as if he was addressing his fellow survivors. And the reason why I did that was because I know that that not a lot of refugees can listen to my podcast because it's in English. Yeah. And so there's a language barrier, but I wanted my father to sit there and say in Khmer, hey, for survivors, I know what you've been through and I know it hurts to talk about it, but I encourage you to talk about it. And this video is on YouTube, um, but it is meant for the eyes of the survivors and the refugees Mm -hmm. because it's directly talks to them and it's not coming from a child perspective it's coming from somebody who actually lived through it with them which makes it more powerful so um I mean just that alone I I'm I'm just that's one of the most things I'm most proudest thing that I have coming out of this podcast so far well I'm super proud of you and I <laughs> hope that we all continue to heal together and thank you for being a role model for the community. Hopefully I'll get to see you one of these days in person. Maybe we can get some Chinese Cambodian food or something. Yeah. Um for those of you who are listening and want to check out your podcast, where can they find it? And where they where can they find you? Um they can find me on Instagram, on Facebook, uh Death in Cambodia podcast. I'm also I also have a website www.deathincambodia.com and um yeah, no, this has been wonderful. I really really appreciate you having me on. Um I I followed you when you were you know when when you were running the uh, DK Donuts as well and you you were definitely such a forefront leader for like the uh the the entire community just like seeing what you did as you transformed that store so um I'm excited for us I'm so proud of us for making this kind of content for our own community it's wonderful thank you and I hope that if you're listening out there and you're inspired to make some content as well related to anything cultural whether that's your own experience growing up or documenting your parents, please, please, please go out there and do it. You know, if it doesn't even go live on the internet, at least you'll have it for your own family. I super enjoyed this episode together. And for those of you who are listening, holla at your girl.